and welcome to Optimizing Outcomes for Adults with Spinal Muscular Atrophy, a patient-centric strategy uh, for the multidisciplinary treatment team. This is presented by Creative Educational Concepts. My name is Claudia Chiraboga. I'm a professor of neurology and pediatrics with the Division of Child Neurology at Columbia University Medical Center. Today, we will cover the following learning objectives, starting with the genetic etiology, pathophysiology, and clinical phenotypes of spinal muscular atrophy in adult patients. We'll evaluate the unique clinical challenge faced by adults with SMA, emphasizing key distinctions from pediatric SMA. We'll appraise completed, ongoing, and planned clinical trial data for novel SMA disease-modifying therapies in adult patients with a focus on the FDA-approved agents. Hope to identify how adaptive SMA therapy strategies incorporating novel disease-modifying treatments can fulfill unmet needs and optimize outcomes in adult patients. We'll use real-world patient cases to design evidence-supported treatment plans for adults with SMA, highlighting the critical importance of patient engagement and shared decision-making. These are my disclosures. And uh, this talk is accredited uh, for continuing education for medicine, pharmacy, and nursing, as listed here. So let's start by characterizing SMA in adult patients and covering the pathophysiology, phenotype, and patient's challenges. So today we're going to focus on classic SMA, also known as 5Q SMA, which is the chromosome where the gene is located, spinal muscular atrophy. There are several types of SMA, but the disease-modifying treatments only apply to 5Q SMA. It does comprise about 95% of the disorders causing SMA. Now, SMA is the result of deficiency in SMN protein. The genetic defect is an autosomal biallelic mutation of the survival motor neuron gene. That can be a homozygous mutation or a compound heterozygote as a point mutation and a deletion. And the, as you have guessed, the product of the SMN1 gene is the SMN protein, which is vital for survival. And uh, the SMN1 gene produces the lion's share of the SMN protein in the body. So low levels of SMN protein, as seen in 5Q SMA, result in progressive loss of spina alpha motor neurons that are exquisitely sensitive to these low levels of SMN protein. This results in turn in denervation, weakness, and atrophy. Now, with a single defect, how is it that SMA comprises such a broad phenotypic diversity from infants to adults? And the reason for that is the SMN2 gene. Now, the SMN2 gene is a paralogous gene that produces a a uh, protein which is non-functional because it is missing exon 7. This delta 7 protein is non-functional. However, there's a small portion of the SMN2 transcripts that are alternatively spliced to include that exon 7 and produce that full-length SMN protein. Hence, you can see how the SMN2 gene copy number, which in human varies from 1 to 5, will modulate the phenotype and it is a disease modifier and is inversely related to phenotype. The lower the number of SMN2 copy numbers, the more severe the phenotype. Inversely, the higher the number of SMN2 copy numbers, the milder the phenotype. 
So this clinical classification of SMA was devised many years ago based on ultimate level of function. And it still is valid for patients who are assessed symptomatically. Not so helpful when patients are treated as with newborn screening before symptoms develop. And it is based on not only the ultimate function, but also the age of presentation. And we divide it into five groups with a type zero, which is peri prenatal and onset and connatal symptoms are present. And these infants are very severe and require respiratory and nutritional support and have a very short life expectancy. And if nothing is done, um, usually survival does not surpass six months. Type 1 SMA, which is the old word Nick Hoffman, is presentation under six months of age. These children usually are not in need of respiratory support at birth, though this will develop as they age, as will dysphagia and need for gastrointestinal support for nutrition. By definition, they never sit, and without respiratory or Nutritional support survival past age two is uh, very improbable. The type one SMA is the most common type and takes about 60% of all SMA uh, types that are available or born in one year because of survival, they're not the most prevalent in later years. It, the uh, type two SMA, which is classified based on their ability to sit so they may lose that ability over time, present between six and 18 months of age. So they do not have respiratory requirements early on, usually not in infancy or under two years of age. They are able to sit. Some might be able to bear weight, but they cannot walk um, by definition. And survival is close to normal. Um, but past 40 or 50 is not that common. And the SMA type three, which are the ambulatory patients, these are patients who are presenting in the pediatric age after 18 months of age and before 18 years. And they can walk at some point in time, though they may lose that ability, especially if they present under age three um, and their ability to walk uh, is uh, what defines them, though they may lose that ability over time. And finally is SMA type four. SMA type four are all very mildly affected, present in adulthood over 18 years of age, and they are usually ambulatory and do not have major progression or speedy progression as we see with the other phenotypes. Now, early treatment of the more severe phenotypes changes the outlook and the natural history. So what I have uh, shared with you is when we do not treat. So what is the prevalence of SMA? Well, it varies across the world. Uh, in some communities where there's a high level of consanguinity, rates might be very high because it is autosomal recessive. And in some populations, uh, it is more prevalent than others. For instance, uh, Europe has higher rates of SMA than do non-European countries. And uh, according to the National Institute of Health, um, the prevalence of SMA type 4 is the least common. It's about 1 in 300,000 as opposed to 1 in 10,000 average for SMA as a whole with, as I said, SMA type 1 being the more common um, uh, for birth prevalence. And um, SMA type 4, which is the adult presenting SMA, represents less than 1% of all SMA cases. So the adults with SMA include that small fraction of SMA type 4 patients who oftentimes are um, suffer delay in diagnosis because it's not what people think typically as SMA related, as well as pediatric onset SMA who survive until adulthood 
past 18 years of age. It is estimated that about 25% of patients with spinal muscular atrophy are adults greater than 18 years of age. And I anticipate that this number is going to expand over time, given the success that we've had with early treatment of pediatric SMA with these disease-modifying therapies that I will share with you shortly. Now, one issue is that till now, SMA has been considered a primarily pediatric disorder with the majority of therapies, disease management strategies, and related healthcare policies targeted to the pediatric population. But there are some differences, and but we can agree that the multidisciplinary approach that is used in neuromuscular uh, multidisciplinary clinics across the nation are very important to provide one source of care that can cover numerous disciplines. But the clinical issues that are prevalent in adults with SMA differ from the pediatric uh, SMA. Fatigue is universal, but it may be more prevalent in milder phenotypes where activity level is uh, more robust. But kidney stones, osteoporosis, acidosis, hypertension, and especially sexual and reproductive health uh, and hormonal issues are of concern in the adult. Weight management is always of import and the understanding that for a weak SMA patient, a 50% weight for their norm of age and height is excessive, given that with decrease in muscle mass, the ideal body weight would be more like 5 or 10%. And for more able-bodied patients with more muscle mass, 25% uh, or so. But above 50%, all that would be primarily fat and the greater weight the patient has, mobility is, is hampered. So it's important to maintain patients um, to be more on the lean side uh, so that mobility can be preserved. And with loss of muscle mass over time, eating the same amount, invariably weight will be gained because of decreased consumption of calories at rest with less muscle mass. So what are the challenges for adult SMA patients? Well, for one, and one that I encounter often is transitioning from pediatric to adult. And that has to be a process. It'd be nice to have support for a special clinic and some areas have that where all the needs of the transition are taken into account. And we have more handholding in pediatric SMA, but in adults, they need to advocate for themselves and understand their health care. That can be very complex. For adults, it may be difficult finding specialists and clinics um, that are knowledgeable for, with adult SMA. It's also increasingly difficult to find financial assistance for equipment, that durable equipment that is so important for quality of life. As we'll see as some reports from SMA adult patients, the feeling that they're undervalued by the health system lack of support from society. And we'll see a little bit more about that in terms of accessibility, uh, the stigma, and how oftentimes they are, are treated in a more infantile fashion. The need to rely on family and friends for support, and that varies across the nation. Some areas have greater uh, societal support, governmental support uh, for their needs, but in other places it is, uh, very different and relying primarily on family. And access to mental health services is an ongoing problem across the nation and is of importance for our adult patients with SMA. So let's switch gears and talk about disease-modifying therapies in SMA, adult SMA specifically. To give a little perspective, this is the SMA timeline. And you'll see in 1967, the three traditional types of SMA classification were developed. The uh, 5Q as the location of 
the classic SMA was identified in 1995 and the SMN survival motor neuron gene one uh, was identified as uh, SMA related. In actually 2011, we dosed at Columbia the first patient with an antisense oligonucleotide, um, first in human. And by 2016, the Food and Drug Administration, I'll call it FDA going forward, approved nusinersen for SMA of all types and all ages. A mere three years later, we had in 2019 approval by the FDA for onosemnogene apoparvivec XIOI, which is the gene transfer therapy for children with SMA. In the, in the US, it's under two years of age. In Europe, it's under 20 kilos, still very young patients. And more recently, um, in 2020, August of 2020, FDA approved the use of Rizdaplam. Initially was approved for SMA patients greater than two months because there wasn't enough data under two months, but that has been, uh, that data is available. And in the United States, it is available for use of patients of all ages. So let's focus a bit on the um, pathophysiology and the mechanism of action. And I will talk about the two medications that are approved for use in adults, which is nusinersen and rizdaplam. We saw an asemnogene is only for young children. So nusinersen is a mRNA-based therapy. It's an antisense oligonucleotide that acts at a specific site on exon 7 on the SMN2 gene, the survival motor neuron 2 gene, so that instead producing a lot of delta-7 non-functional SMN protein through alternative splicing, it's a skipping of the exon skipping, the exon 7 is included and there is more transcription of the full-length SMN protein. It is approved for use in pediatrics and adult patients. Now, Antisense oligonucleotides do not cross the blood-brain barrier, so it has to be administered intrathecally. And current uh, treatment modalities um, is a loading dose, four loading doses, day 1, 15, 30, and 60, and then maintenance every four months, and the dose still is 12 milligrams per 5 mLs. The warning and precautions include thrombocytopenia, coagulation abnormalities, and renal toxicity. The ENDEAR study um, showed efficacy of nusinersen in infants. And the other pivotal trial, which is late onset SMA, primarily SMA type 2, was the CHERISH trial that showed efficacy in children, supposedly between 2 and 12 years of age, but the youngest child was age 9. and um, it excluded patients with scoliosis of any note, had to be less than 30 degrees. So there are studies with nusinersen in adults, but they are not placebo-controlled trials. They're observational studies. There is this large prospective cohort study by Tim Hagenacker in Germany of 173 patients from 16 to 65 years of age. 139 were eligible. Their primary outcome was the Hammersmith functional motor scale expanded, the same outcome measure used in the pediatric nusinersen pivotal trials. And secondary outcomes was the revised upper limb module, which is primarily upper body and very useful for very weak uh, type 2 patients. And the six-minute walk test, which is distant walks in six minutes, that is useful, obviously, in ambulatory patients. And they assessed the change from baseline 6, 10, and 14 months. And these were significant over time. The only point I'd like to make is that only about half of the patients reached the 14 months in this assessment, and that these were milder affected patients. And you can see by the range of the baseline and the six-minute walk test over 300 meters, and that Many of them had 24 points on their Hammersmith, that these were not the most impaired patients. The majority of them were not 
very impaired. So they had a robust response. If you look at the Hammersmith over time, by 14 months, the change from baseline was over three points, which is clinically meaningful. That is improvement of one point and half of another point. And if you look at the proportion that had greater than three points, by 14 months, and even by 10 months, 35 to 45% of them had had that kind of improvement. And the six minute walk test had had improvement as well from 22, 31 up to 46 meters, which is um, clinically significant. The other large study, also German, is a retrospective cohort study of 116 patients, 18 to 72. They had type two patients and type three patients and had the largest number of type three patients. And here you can see how they are divided and we're looking at percent responders. Um, and the type two, you can see that the Hammersmith was not very robust at the end of the assessment. Um, and that's because it's not very useful for patients who have contractures and are sitting in a chair and have difficulties with transitions. Um, but the ROM, which is upper body, they showed a significant improvement and that's two points on the ROM. Uh, and of course they don't walk. And then with the SMA type three, about half of them were responders on the Hammersmith and there were lesser responders on the ROM and that's more of a ceiling effect. If your upper body is very strong, there's not much room to go up, but they did have 42 improvement, percent improvement overall. And if you look overall, the response in the different domains, but over 60% of patients, uh, adult patients treated with nusinersen had a response. Now, let's focus on Rizdaplam. Now, Rizdaplam is also mRNA-based. It's a small molecule that also acts on the SMN2 mRNA, very similar but slightly different location to increase inclusion of exon 7 and thus increase the full length SMN protein that is transcribed from the SMN2 gene. And it is indicated in the US for patients of all ages and for those over two months of age in other parts where it is approved. Now, it is the only oral medication. It's a liquid and it's administered by mouth with a daily uh, dose, either mouth or G-tube. It has the advantage of having systemic distribution and enters into the central nervous system as evident by preclinical studies with almost a one-to-one -one correspondence. The most common side effects are fever, diarrhea, and rash. And the diarrhea is uh, transient. Within two, three weeks, it improves over time. Um, it's important to stop um, any um, laxatives that the patient may need because of their SMA because they won't need it while they're on Rizdaplan. Firefish is an open label study that showed efficacy of Rizdaplan in infants two to seven months of age. But we are more interested in adults. And that's where sunfish comes into play. It has two parts. Part one was exploratory and a dose finding to find the ideal uh, treatment dose. And it included that first part, ambulant and non-ambulant type two or three patients. The distinction of sunfish, it's the only one that includes adults. It goes up to 25 years of age, two to 25. And part two is the pivotal part, the double-blind placebo control trial. The primary outcome is a little different. It was the MFM. The MFM32 is a bit more sensitive, especially in weaker patients than the Hammersmith, which as we saw, if you have lots of contractures, it doesn't really um, change very much because the lower body is not going to recover as much and there are contractures. But the MFM does take into account extremities, proximal and standing and axial uh, strength. So it's a little more sensitive in that regard. There were secondary endpoints as well, which in addition is the Rome, the Hammersmith, force vital capacity, the SMAs, the spinal muscular atrophy independent scale, which was found uh, 
to, to um, be sensitive to changes and also the proportion of patients rated as improved on the clinical global impression change. Another difference with the sunfish is that these were patients who were uh, more advanced in severity uh, than, for example, the Nusenersen trial. Patients could have scoliosis hardware and about the majority had scoliosis and about uh, a third of them or a quarter of them had greater than 40 degrees scoliosis. So a very different uh, and more severe and age-wise heterogeneous group of patients. And here you can see the age distribution. There's about similar proportion of two to five and six to 11, about a quarter of 12 to 17, and 12% 12 who were 18 to 25. And as you can see, and I'll bring your attention to the list square mean change from baseline and the MFM total score, you can see that the blue is the Rizdaplan group and the red is the placebo group. And as you can see over the 52 weeks, there's a divergence so that there is a change of 1.36 points in from baseline in the Rizdaplan group. And as there's a decline of 0.9 teen uh, from uh, the placebo group. And if you consider the, the delta between those two, it's 1.55 points. The Rome also improved 1.61 points versus really no change. And they also had changes on the SMAs uh, with improvement in activities of daily living, such as brushing their teeth. Ongoing studies. So for patients who were in the Nusenersen trials, the phase one slash two and the pivotal trials, SHINE is where they were all taken for long-term open label extension. And that study, which has been going on for some of us 10 years or more, is now coming to an end for the Nusenersen treated patients this year, 2023. Now, Jewel Fish, a study that I'm very involved with, is an ongoing exploratory comparative open label study for patients who are non-naive, meaning they have been treated with SMA specific medication uh, prior to enrolling in the RISDAPLAM study and followed over time. And this is expected to change in 2024. It's primarily a safety and tolerability, but some outcome measures are also included. So we've talked about disease modifying therapies. Now let's talk about a patient's perspective. And uh, this is uh, from Mazella. Uh, I think this is from the QSMA um, study. And their perception is many adults and teens speak to me as though I'm much younger and talk to the person I'm with or act as though I'm really not there. I feel people judge me just by seeing the wheelchair. People treat me like I'm a baby or mentally disabled or too innocent, and I am none of those things. It makes me sad when people stare at me. I know they're probably just curious, but still it makes me upset. I was just diagnosed with depression and anxiety, mostly from constant worrying about my life and having SMA. I think that in some cases, having SMA makes me want to work harder and prove others wrong. But at the same time, there are a lot of days when I just want to give up and say, what's the point? And I think this brings to mind the need to educate uh, people that SMA is, uh, affects motor function and mobility, but cognitively, there is no effect. On the contrary, these are patients who are very smart and they've given support. They're able to, um, you know, attend secondary education and be gainfully employed. So the changing landscape. And let's just talk a bit about what the landscape looks like for the adult patient. So there are now three disease modifying therapies 
And though the ones who have received on a semnogene apoparvovic are still not close to adulthood, they will eventually reach adulthood. The patients who have been studied as children will reach adulthood. And we really don't know what to expect in adults who've had SMA and have been treated for a period of time. How will they present? There are a lot of uncertainties. What are the best clinical practice? We know how to manage children and their guidelines, but we really don't know. We don't know even what is the best outcome measure to use in adults. Clearly, using the expectations of a response that were found in young children, in adults who have had their disease for many, many years is not appropriate. Moreover, some insurance companies demand the Hammersmith, where the Hammersmith is very insensitive to somebody who's been in a wheelchair and relies on their upper body uh, and don't have to switch or try to stand or rotate. Those are things that they have not been able to do for a while. So it's not the appropriate instrument to use something like the roll. And then there are those intangibles that aren't adequately measured that we need to document when seeing them. For one young man, the ability to do this with his hand was the difference between being able to drive his modified truck and being independent from being dependent on others and not being able to fend for himself when he had to travel distances. Uh, so we're still struggling with that, and there have to be more recent resources applied to understand the best approach. But overall, I think the biggest difference that needs to be understood, and the point has to be made, is that the natural history of SMA is that there is a decline over time. It slows down um, as they age, but it still is um, something that is measurable. On the MFM, there's a decline of one point, I think it's 1.7 points or 1.2 points every year. So keeping the function that you have is very important and should be an acceptable outcome measure in our older, weaker patients. Um, the healthcare providers involved in the treatment of adult SMA should be more cognizant of these issues and engage with patients to improve their care treatment outcome on a patient-centric basis. I think it's important to know what's important for them, what kind of activities or mobilities that are necessary for them so that they can optimize their care and have better quality of life. So the standards of care that do exist aren't really geared towards adult patients and don't cover a lot of the things that affect adults and those need to be developed. So aspirations. So a group of SMA uh, experts uh, published recently a call to action to improve care and empower adults with SMA. And I think some of the things that were discussed, the age appropriate and comprehensive care that delivers the most meaningful health outcomes and quality of life for adults living with SMA and identifying what those are. There needs to be greater study um, and quality of life measures in this age group and a better understanding of what are the optimum type of uh, instruments to adequately gauge response and what response is clinically meaningful in that age group. And that goes to stability as opposed to expecting a very high response in order to determine that a medication is useful. And then to establish more integrated pathways that enable adults living with SMA to optimally manage their multifaceted healthcare needs. Um, mobility is always an issue. Reaching the clinic is always an issue. Um, so multidisciplinary is very helpful. So you minimize the number of visits that are needed but increasingly the use of remote assessments for durable equipment, for visits, um, the use of digital apps 
to help give some feedback in real time uh, to the providers when the patient cannot uh, be seen. This happens mostly in the winter or snowy days, rainy days where it becomes more problematic. And then strengthen the social and financial support systems that empower adults living with SMA and their caregivers to fulfill their personal goals. We were talking before about with support going to college, there are colleges that are better at being wheelchair accessible and providing more support for the patients. But for many, it's all dependent on the family and that can be uh, a burden um, at some point for them, especially as parents age and they may not be able to provide that kind of support. So what other conversations can we have? So now let's go into cases. And this is the case of GR. GR is a 20 year old woman who was diagnosed with SMA at 12 months of age. She is wheelchair confined. She goes about in her power wheelchair. She recently moved to the area with her parents and she's establishing care with you as her healthcare provider. So the question is, how would you classify GR's adult SMA? So let's review a bit the clinical classification of SMA. She's in a wheelchair. So you don't have history of whether she was walking or not, because she could be a non-ambulatory type uh, three. However, the age of presentation early at 12 months of age, as you can see in this chart, would indicate that she has SMA type two. And the musculoskeletal deformities, scoliosis, contractures, hip dysplasias, those are some of the major issues that SMA type two patients have over time because they are not bearing weight and they are constantly sitting. And they sit even more as they become older because transitioning is harder to do. Let's continue with GR. She reports that prior to moving, she received the majority of her care from her pediatric neurologist. That might be me because I have some adult patients that are finding it hard to transition. And she does some mobility exercises on her own that she found on the internet, and she has a history of recurrent respiratory infections. She also reports she recently created a dating profile and is excited to meet new people in the area. So what would be the most appropriate referrals for GR? Physical therapy, pulmonary, sexual and reproductive health, all of the above. Well, with SMA type two, there is progression, um, starts in the legs, then goes to the arms, then the respiratory and swallowing even. So it would be of interest to, for her to see the pulmonologist and make sure that she has adequate support cough assist or even BiPAP at night if she has some nocturnal hypoventilation to prevent pneumonia. The physical therapy would be key because of the contractures that develop over time. Again, in the adult world, it's sometimes hard to come by and to get that covered, um, which is not always easy. In the pediatric world, the school provides that kind of um, service, but in the adult world, it sometimes takes some doing to find the right setting and having the time to go. And as many of my young men in college finding the time to do something that they don't see the value for, because thinking ahead is not something that young brains do very well. And then because she's considering dating sexual and reproductive health needs to be considered as well. So it would be all of the above. And these uh, are all various aspects that should be uh, assessed during the multidisciplinary clinic. So not only the multidisciplinary clinic is to 
have multidisciplinary services, but as the provider, if you are the neurologist or you're a physiatrist, it is covering all aspects of care and making appropriate referrals. That includes bone health, pulmonary, orthopedic, mental health, um, endocrine. All of these need to be uh, reviewed and referrals made if you do not have that specialty within your setting. Um, another thing that adults deal with more than children is um, another aspect that is more germane to adults living, especially those living on their own, is trying to approach a rehabilitation hospital or some such facility that provides assessments for smart homes where there can be a minimum amount of uh, mobility needed to do routine activities uh, so that there can be more independence for patients who are disabled. And of course, management of all of the factors that are listed here. We continue. GR is currently being treated with Nusinersen for her SMA. She reports she has been on it for several years and has noted her muscle weakness has been progressing recently. She also reports severe anxiety leading up to each intrathecal administration of the drug. Which of the following is most appropriate to recommend? Switch Nusinersen to Rizdiplam, switch Nusinersen to Onesemnogen Apoparvovic XIOI, Add rizdiplam to nusinersen or no changes are needed. So do you need to treat a patient who's on a specific medication if they are doing well? No, uh, just because there is something new, if they are doing well with the current therapy, there is no reason to change. There's no head-to-head -head comparison between the two. However, if a patient is having a decline in function, then it's clearly appropriate to consider if the other medication that's available would be appropriate. And to that point, number B would not be appropriate because as an adult, you would never consider on a semnogene as something that you would transition to. The other aspect is adding rizdiplam to nusinersen. Though many of my patients would like to be able to do that, uh, insurances do not allow it. There's a theoretical risk of excess SMN being uh, possibly neurotoxic, especially to dorsal root ganglia. Um, and the other aspect for changing is access. So many patients who, as in case of GR, is severely anxious or over time because of some distribution issues with nusinersen that not enough reaches the um, the respiratory, cervical, um, spinal cord, or bulbar um, wish to change because of weakness in the upper body, proximal area, or trouble with breathing or swallowing difficulties that develop over time, which may benefit from a change. And so rizdiplam and nusinersen together is not allowed. It's one disease modifying therapy at a time. And not changing if she's very anxious is um, not appropriate either because this is long-term. And we're talking about, if you continue with nusinersen, a lifetime of every four months injections that would be hard to manage for someone who has this degree of situational anxiety. And as we saw, there's more data with sunfish as to its efficacy in the adult age group than there is with uh, nusinersen, especially in the, the more advanced patient as she would be, being that she presented at age 12 months, that it would clearly be appropriate to, to use rizdiplam with the hope that at the very least it would stabilize her disease so she wouldn't have progression and she could keep the function she has. And if uh, you're lucky, then you can have some improvement in upper body strength and respiratory function, head control and the like that oftentimes happens when you go to a systemically distributed medication. 
GR's parents are worried about her physical and mental health as GR ages. They want to support her in any way they can. So which of the following is the most appropriate response? There are very few uncertainties regarding best clinical practice, treatment respond, and long-term outcomes for adults with SMA. We have an abundance of data in this patient population. Standards of care are geared toward adult patients and are an informative resource for caregivers and healthcare professionals. Some helpful resources include Cure SMA, Muscular Dystrophy Association, and the uh, National Organization for Rare Diseases, NORD. And D, it is not important to emphasize a patient-centered approach to managing SMA in adults. Continued care through pediatric providers is recommended. So um, the foils in this response, except for C, are the opposite of what the reality of adult SMA is. We are uncertain. We don't know uh, the best clinical practice. There are no guidelines geared towards adults with SMA. So uh, that is not the right response. We talked about how the standards of care were developed with pediatric SMA in mind. And I'm hoping that at the end of this discussion that I've emphasized enough that it's a patient-centered approach, that cogwheel where it's the patient and the family who are leading uh, along with the neurologist overseeing the totality of the care, or it could be a physiatrist or pulmonologist who sometimes run these programs. Whoever that person is, together they set goals and they decide what is the best approach for them. And it's a give and take. It's never the doctor's decision. It's a discussion. And what we provide to our patients is the information that they use to decide what is best for them and what are the goals that they are looking for. And our role is also to set realistic expectations, knowing where they are in their disease. Is it early symptomatic? Is it late symptomatic? Is it advanced disease? All of those factors play a role as to what the expectation of response will be. And here are the resources, and I would recommend um, Going to these, there's Cure SMA, the Muscular Dystrophy Association, SMA What My Way, National Organization for Rare Disorders, and SMA News Today. All of these are wonderful resources, and they're also good ways for patients to keep abreast in case there are new research opportunities for them and their age group. And with that, I conclude uh, this presentation on optimizing outcomes for adults with spinal muscular atrophy, with a patient-centric strategies for multidisciplinary treatment teams. Thank you for your attention.